What we want to do today is talk about uh, Silicon Valley today. You know, and Silicon Valley is an interesting word. <coughs> it's been around for a long time and it gives the impression of continuity since really the late 1950s. But the re reality is that Silicon Valley changes all the time, very, very rapidly, probably more rapidly than any, any other ecosystem. And Silicon Valley in 2015 is not the same as Silicon Valley in even 2014. So what we want to do is look at the specifics of Silicon Valley today and understand um, it from the point of view both of a startup entrepreneur and from the point of view of an investor. So let's, uh, let's get into it. What I want to do is look at five things. Firstly, I want to talk about how startup funding has changed. Secondly, in the context of that, what investors are looking for. Thirdly, how to think about startup ideas in that context. Um, fourthly, to address the specifics of storytelling um, in 2015. And lastly, I want to give an example by using the advice in the first slides to, um, to, to craft a pitch for one of my startups that comes out of my incubator, Archimedes Labs. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> well, this slide is just a random selection, it took me five minutes to pull together, of all of the coverage about the phenom phenom phenomenon known as unicorns. A unicorn, as you all know, is a company valued over a billion dollars by investors. And this slide is showing that almost everything in the valley today is shaped to this, uh, this phenomenon. Um, VC firms are measured by how many unicorns they've invested in. Incubators are measured by how many of the unicorns they were in on day one. Uh, founders are measured by what the valuation of their company is last round, measured against that of other companies valued over a billion dollars. And there's huge discussions and debates about how good or bad this phenomenon is, but nobody denies it's real and dominating. This, uh, this is a, a graphic that shows why. <clears throat> this graphic is from the Wall Street Journal. It starts in February 2014 when there were 41 companies valued over a billion dollars uh, and one valued over $10 billion. This is what happened in the um, 17 months since then. This is the growth. We go in 17 months, in fact it's a little bit less than 17 months, it's um, 16 months, from 41 companies to 94 companies valued over a billion dollars. Quite a few valued over 10 billion and two valued over 40 billion dollars. Uh, so this is, a, this is a huge trend that uh, quite understandably is dominating everybody's thinking. So how has that changed startup funding? Well, the first thing to understand is, the, is, is what, the, what the graph of startup funding looks like, measured by the amount of money available at each stage. And this is uh, an attempt to do that. We see that over three to five years, if you break down seed capital from venture capital to growth capital, that uh, about $5 billion exists in the Valley to invest in seed rounds over that three to five year range. Um, that three to five billion dollars is typically portioned out in chunks of anywhere between a hundred thousand dollars at the low end of the range up to a couple of million dollars at the high end of the range uh, and, uh, and with a few outliers even higher than that in seed rounds. And there are around about 2,000 deals a year that get done. Um, uh, that, that are seed rounds coming from established uh, venture firms, <coughs> uh, micro funds or angels here in the Valley. Now the first striking thing to note is that the amount of money available at the next stage, venture capital, and venture capital is we're typically talking about an A round uh, uh, or a B round or maybe even a C round. Venture capital uh, is capital that used to take risk, but increasingly venture capital 
is only going to companies that have proven traction, where the risk to a large degree has been taken out of the equation. And the amount of money available there is only two to three billion dollars. That is to say, less than the amount of money available in seed. And only a, only a very tiny percentage of the seeded companies ever make it to venture capital. A typical venture round, if it's an A round, is in the three to seven million dollar range as a raise. So way less companies get uh, way less money uh, in the aggregate, uh, but more for each individual company. And that tells you that the death rate at the seed stage is very high. It's well over 90 percent. Um, and less than 10 percent of those companies go to do an A, B or a C round. And then the elephant in the room is growth capital. Growth capital is, is, is really when pretty much all the risk has been taken out of an investment, or at least that's the perception. This is the kind of money that goes into companies like Snapchat or Uber, um, and it's measured in very large sums coming from very large organizations. Um, this growth capital craze kicked off in around about 2007, 2008. Um, it was fully mature by 2010 when people were investing in Facebook at valuations in the billions of dollars. Um, and that proved to be a successful investment. So Twitter was the next beneficiary with Kleiner Perkins, for example, investing very late at very high valuations, billions of dollars into Twitter. So growth capital really isn't risk capital at all. It's more like private equity uh, uh, or, or, or uh, mutual funds. Um, this is companies investing in proven winners prior to an IPO, which um, is now more or less the dominant kind of investing for late stage companies. And to be able to attract that investment, you really have to have of, um, of, of growing huge quickly and still be growing. This is Mark Andreessen in a recent New Yorker talking about this. He, he says this, he says, each year 3,000 startups approach A16Z with a warm intro from someone the firm knows. A16Z invests in 15 and of those at least 10 will fold. So 5 out of 3,000 get life. Three or four of those will prosper, and one might soar to be worth more than a billion dollars, a unicorn. With great luck, once a decade, that unicorn will become a Google or a Facebook, which means you know, a, a, about one uh, a, a unicorn out of every, every generation uh, over you know, 10 years, maybe three, four, five unicorns, of which one will become a Facebook or a Google. And that one will be over a thousand x return for the VC's money. There are 803 VC firms in the US and last year they spent $48 billion chasing that dream. So in other words, the VC firms are increasingly looking at you as you walk into the room and asking the question, is this a candidate unicorn? And if the answer is no, you become invisible pretty quickly. Um, and that is the game that he's describing here. This is the number of firms that are investing uh, in the seed stage. These are what we call micro funds. Micro funds are funds under $100 million. And in that list, very long list, there are 135 of them. In fact, the list's a little out of date. There's more like 150 now. On the other side of the equation, this is from Sequoia Capital's website. Uh, their growth strategy is <coughs> to invest 10 to 100 million dollars to help companies scale up, build commanding market positions and realize their highest ambitions. In other words, uh, don't come to us if there's still a risk, but as long as the risk is gone, you can have a very large amount of money from us uh, and, 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 and uh, we'd be very keen to give it to you. This is, these two slides represent the two extremes, the two poles. In the middle, between the two, very little money. Another example, Index Ventures, run by Danny Reimer and, uh, and his colleagues, which only a year ago said they were going to go back to their roots and invest in seed and startups, raising a fund of over $700 million uh, for growth, 
for growth investing, which, um, which is um, the antithesis of what they said they were going to do. So, <clears throat> what does this mean investors are looking for? Well, the first thing to say is investors are, above all else, rational. And this, what we could call unicorn hunting, is not a craze that has no substance. There's real substance uh, under the surface here. And the substance is that we now have a world in which a software developer can write code submit it to two app stores, the Google Play Store and the iTunes App Store, and within 24 hours have that software available to up to 2 billion people on smartphones, a number that's going to grow to 4 billion during the next 3 to 4 years. So we're living in a world where getting big fast is entirely plausible. And not only plausible, uh, there are proven companies that have done it, getting to literally billions of users quickly. Snapchat is an obvious example, but there's many others. So this unicorn hunting is not fanciful. It really is possible to build a unicorn and to build it quickly if you do the right thing. It's an interesting point, but if you're a startup founder, you'll have had the experience of trying to raise money and walk into a room and all the questions are about your traction. What is your traction? What is your cohort analysis looking like? Uh, how engaged are your users this month compared to the users you got last month? And what's the trajectory of growth? What is your uh, viral uh, coefficient? In other words, for one person that joins, how many other people do they make join? Um, traction is the buzzword of the moment. And the reason it is, is because investors largely have no way to understand whether you're a candidate unicorn other than through your numbers. Mark Andreessen makes fun of this. He was talking to one of his founders, uh, a guy called Doshi, and he said to Doshi, mediocre VCs want to see that your company has traction. The top VCs want you to show them that you can invent the future. In other words, the VCs that are asking for numbers and proof of traction uh, are VCs with no real product intuition and no real sense of history. Uh, have no way to gauge you, your idea and your team other than through numbers. And therefore will only invest once the numbers tell them that it's a no-brainer. Whereas the best VCs will still have the ability to gauge you, your team, your idea, your story and the possibility in a historical context of your success. And those are the VCs that a startup founder should want to pitch, uh, certainly at the early stage, um, if they want to raise sufficient funds to build a big idea quickly. It's worth saying, next time you go to a VC and they ask you about your traction, you should probably print out this New Yorker article and show them that quote so they feel mediocre. Only kidding. So how should you think about startup ideas in this context? Well, this is how I think about them. You really have to divide the world into, um, into a historical context, um, separating out the past, the present, and the future uh, when, when thinking about companies and products. And where that oval overlaps, where it says now, on the leading edge of that oval, which is a little bit into the future, that is the place that a startup has to play. Uh, think about it. If you walk into a room and you say you're going to build a website uh, that people will come to uh, to read news, um, like say Yahoo was back in the late 1990s, that really is not an interesting idea. It's very much part of the past, not even part of the present, and certainly not part of the future. Or if you say you're going to build a social network to uh, glue people together uh, so they can find each other and talk to each other and communicate with each other, again, you know, d being done, uh, Facebook, it does exist, Twitter does exist, 
very unlikely to be part of the future, more likely part of the past, and, and, and again, not even part of the present. If you say you're going to build a search engine, no, not part of the future. Uh, in fact, almost anything you say you want to do that people you know, recognize as something that already exists, not interesting um, because it really doesn't represent the way the future is going to be. Startup founders who want to be candidate unicorns, which is really the only kind of founder that, that, that uh, VCs are looking for, have to be able to talk about a product that doesn't yet exist. Uh, one that may even sound unusual and strange um, and in fact the more unusual and strange it sounds the more interesting it's likely to be uh, 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 as long as it has some historical validity. Um, here's how I think about it. There's really only two entities that exist in the present. There's the living dead, that is to say companies like America Online, Yahoo, arguably even Google and Facebook, which have already gone through their growth phase and are now simply surviving, but not growing in any meaningful way. Um, uh, certainly, even if they're growing, uh, they, they don't represent what's coming next. They represent what's already been. They're still very much alive, hence the living dead, but they're, 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 they're the um, leading indicators of what used to be, not what will be. And the second entity that exists in the present is the unborn. The unborn, you should think of this as you know, uh, a, a pregnancy in its first trimester when there is a baby, but it isn't visible. The unborn are product ideas that already have a basis in reality but nobody really talks about them yet. Nobody can really see them. And that you have got an insight into that unborn idea, that unborn product, that nobody else has yet had. Uh, you know, good examples of this might be in the world of uh, beacons and sensors, for example, which are just beginning to emerge into retail contexts and another context where smartphones and beacons and the new mobile cloud come together to create software and human experiences that have never previously existed. Um, uh, much of what I just said is real, it's already there, but it's, it's so much under the, the radar and under the surface that it is not yet a dominant theme. Those are the ideas that get attention because they have the opportunity to be huge. Uh, and you have the opportunity to be the owner of the idea because nobody else finds it interesting yet. It's almost uh, a truism, but you know, if you can choose an idea that accelerates the death of the old and accelerates the birth of the new, when you walk into a room to pitch, you will stand out as being a unicorn candidate simply because you don't sound like something that already exists. And that is rule number one in the present. So what does that mean for storytelling? Let's talk about that. Telling the story of a company is, is hard and uh, most founders don't do a good job of it. Um, but actually in its essentials it's very, very simple. There are three elements to a story. There's a beginning, what am I doing now? There's an end. What, what will this be when it's fully complete and finished? And there's a plot. How will I get from now to then? What is the path? What are the steps? What is the roadmap? And these are the essential three parts of, 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 um, of any story. When a publisher chooses to publish a book, it's very unlikely they're going to pay the writer the advance unless the writer already has done the work to think through these three elements. The only difference between writing a book and telling the story of a company is that you reverse the beginning and the end. You start with the end. That is to say, what will this be when it's fully finished? You then talk about what you've done so far 
and then you talk about how you're going to get from one to the other. A great example of this is Reed Hastings at Netflix. When Netflix started, Reed Hastings had a spreadsheet. Uh, I've seen the spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet was like this. First line was, how many people exist in the world? The second line uh, broke them down into countries. The third line said, of those people, how many have got a DVD player at home? And the next line below that said, of those people with a DVD player at home, how many of them will rent a DVD as opposed to buying it? Which is pretty much all of them. And then the last one was, how many of the people who rent would prefer home delivery and no late fees? Two ideas that didn't exist at that time. It sounded weird, actually, home-delivered DVDs. Um, and, and then the final one was how much would they pay for that monthly as a fee. And from that, that spreadsheet showed that Netflix could be a multi-billion dollar business in the USA alone. And as it expanded around the world, would be into the tens of billions of dollars. Now, the other great thing about the spreadsheet was because it showed the rollout in countries, there was also a roadmap built, baked into that very spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet represented the end. What will this be when it's fully scaled out? At that point, Reed took investors into a room, which um, uh, the rumors are this was in his house. It was a, a room that used to be his, his uh, uh, study or dining room. I'm not sure which. And it was lined with shelves with DVDs on, and there were two ladies stuffing envelopes with DVDs. And at that moment, the investors looked at the room, and that room then existed in a context of a spreadsheet, which meant that they could see that the current execution related to an endpoint that was enormous. And the room didn't seem small anymore. The room seemed huge. Huge because it was the first step towards a goal that made every bit of sense. And the, the rest is history. Netflix was funded and it grew and it executed the roadmap pretty much exactly as the spreadsheet said. Uh, with the addition recently of streaming, it's an even bigger business than it used to be before. If Reed Hastings would have taken those people into the room first, it would have been entirely underwhelming, in fact frightening to an investor. And the one thing an investor does not want to be is afraid. They want to feel greedy. They want to feel like they have to own a piece of this because if they don't, it's going to be huge and they'll miss out. And the only way to create that fear of missing out is to tell your story in this way. So let me give you an example. This is uh, one of my companies. And uh, we'll do the pitch exactly uh, uh, um, uh, the way that I just described. Here we go. Hi, good morning. I want to uh, introduce you to Chat Center. Chat Center is a new, a new company out of Archimedes Labs, which is addressing a, a major problem at this point in the history of the internet. And here's the problem. We live in a world that has elements of both the future and the past. The future is that there are now two billion people with smartphones who, for the most part, no longer sit down at a laptop or a desktop during their day. They're, they're mobile and their computer is in their pocket. At the same time, there are more than one billion websites on the planet. Pretty much every business has one, whether the business is a one-person business or a major global corporate. And Consumers still discover those businesses primarily through their websites. Billions, if not trillions, of visitors a day to websites. And that gives rise to a problem because those website visitors do not have a business owner just sitting there at a laptop waiting for them to engage. The problem is how can a web visitor connect to a mobile business owner? How is it possible for somebody to come to a website let's say for a plumber or a carpenter, and pretty much instantly ask questions of the business owner. Are you available tomorrow? How much would it cost to do X or Y? And so on and so forth. Uh, today that process is broken. 
Typically, you fill in a web form, and if you're very, very lucky, you'll get an answer sometime later because the business owner is out on a job on his smartphone and doesn't even know you're on his website. Well, we've come up with a very, very simple idea, but a very powerful idea. In fact, so powerful that if any of you in the room today run a business with a website, you're going to want to be a customer of Jazz Center before we finish this, this pitch. It's called a simple universal web address for chat, a simple universal chat address. Now, you all know what a universal address is. You all have at least one and probably two. Uh, the first would be your phone number. It's universal because if you tell me the number and I dial it, your phone is going to ring. And it doesn't matter whether you're in another country, on another carrier network, um, uh, using a different smartphone than I'm using, uh, your phone will ring just because I know the number. A universal address is one where knowing the address is sufficient to engage with the owner of the address. Well, now you know that, the other obvious one is your email address. You can be on Google Mail and I can be on iCloud. As long as I know your email address and I create an email with that address in it, you will receive my email. And in that sense, email is universal as well. Well, chat isn't like that. Chat is not universal. Uh, the history of chat has created uh, a fragmented set of companies that provide chat services either on the web or on mobile, sometimes on both, where in order to chat with somebody, you have to have the same app as them. And then once you've overcome that hurdle, you then have to know what their identity is inside that app. And then you can chat with them. So it is not universal, it's the opposite of universal. It's like in the old days of the telephone network when you couldn't just call a number, you had to first call the operator and ask the operator then connect you to somewhere else and they would have to plug in a, a cable in order to connect your local network to the network of the person receiving it and that may have to happen five or six times to connect long distance to somebody. Um, that's how fragmented and atomized and, and frankly uh, out of date mobile chat and web chat are today. So we've created a simple universal chat address where just knowing the address of the owner is enough to talk to them. No need to install software or do anything else. It makes you reachable on any device, anywhere and at any time. And it looks like this. It looks like this. Chat.center slash whatever your name is. And yes, it's a URL. A URL. And because it's a URL, it can use your domain name as well. There's 270 domain names in the world, and every one of them can have this. Chat whatever.com or .net or .org or .cn or .uk. It doesn't really matter. And just like you can have a www address on your domain, you can have a chat address on your domain. In fact, more than one. You can have multiple addresses, one for each person if you like, or one for each department if you'd like. What that makes possible is this. Here's a, a business owner having a coffee at a Pete's. This is her website. She's a lawyer. This is her Twitter, this is her Facebook, this is her LinkedIn. By putting this simple universal chat address, which is clickable in any of these environments, a visitor can click on them and will be typing a message to her that she'll receive on her smartphone or her Apple Watch while she's sitting there having a coffee. From the customer point of view, it will look as if she has a call center. In fact, her smartphone has been turned into a call center. Now, if you think about UR, what URLs did for linked pages, you know, before the URL, there were millions of pages in books and magazines and newspapers all around the world, which existed uh, independently from each other and could not refer to each other easily. And once there were URLs, there were now hundreds of billions of pages which were linked together, creating trillions of connections every day as people clicked on them. Imagine if 
URLs existed for every business and every individual on the planet. Imagine the connections between people and businesses, or people and people, that would be created by a simple universal chat address. So what we've done is we've turned names into links. And everyone has a name. People have names, businesses have names, government departments have names, and so on and so forth. And we've created three ways for the owner of a name to make it available for people who want to reach that owner. The first is very, very appropriate for any web environment. It's a click to chat button, behind which is the universal chat address. And somebody just clicks on it and immediately they're chatting with the owner of the name. Secondly, there's a plain and simple URL. The good thing about a URL is it's human readable and therefore it's very appropriate to be printed or to put into video or on pictures and advertisements, for example. And then the third is a chat widget, which is appropriate for those times when you want the customer to stay in context, for example, in an e-commerce website to stay in the site, but still be able to chat to the business owner. Those three implementations cover pretty much every use case. The good thing about a universal chat address is it can glue together the web and mobile. On the left is the website, that's what the customer sees. And on the right is the chat, that's what the owner of the business sees. Same with social media. On the left is a Twitter profile with a clickable chat link. On the right is what the owner of that link sees. It works from app to app. So if app A wants to provide help services to its users, it can put a clickable chat address in there and the owner of the business will get the messages on their smartphone and be able to help the users of their app. But it also can work between app A and app B. If both of them implement chat addresses, it's possible for, chat, uh, for, for app A users to initiate chat with app B users making chat a horizontal platform that exists across apps rather than one that's locked up in a single app. And it also works from email to mobile. It works both in email campaigns, like a MailChimp campaign, for example, or um, just in your signature in your, in your email. And of course, it works mobile to mobile, like every other chat uh, Client. If you install our iOS chat client and take a name and somebody else, your friend, installs our chat client and takes a name, the two of you can talk to each other through the chat center client app to app. In that regard, it's very similar to any other chat. It's got a very familiar user interface. It looks like iMessage, so nothing really to learn. And it also works on the Apple Watch, so it's very modern and up to date. We sell chat names for $3.99 a month, which is extremely cheap um, uh, in the context. The, the, there are competing services which offer web-to-web -web chat to a, kind of a call center back end, which are typically about 10 times as expensive as this. Uh, and there are mobile-to-mobile -mobile chat, which don't really play uh, the role that we play and can't really be used for, for these use cases. We also do group chat now. So you can have a chat address that allows lots of people to chat with each other and with you simultaneously, and those are $9.99 a month. So how big could this be? Well, there's 270 million domain names on the planet. That is to say, people who already value a name and are paying for it. In this case, they're primarily using it for websites or email addresses. Now they can use the name for mobile chat as well. About a billion websites sit on top of those domain names and about 30% of those billion websites are our target customer. That is to say businesses who are sufficiently small that they can't pay for a real call center but want to offer their customers call center like abilities. At an average price of three dollars per name and an average number of names per site of about one and a half, because people typically buy their chat ID for themselves and for their business, like business.com slash help or slash support might be one ID, 
and business.com slash name of owner would be a second one. So at a very conservative one and a half names per user, uh, from about 50% of those 30% uh, of businesses, uh, of websites that are businesses, we think there's about 60 million addressable names that we could sell over the next five years. And at the end of the day, that is $182 million a year, uh, a month of revenues, or $2.18 billion a year. So this is a very, very large opportunity. We tested that with a proof of concept. We sent out initially 1,000 emails and then 16,000 emails to people who had registered a domain name roughly four months ago. About 50% of the recipients of these emails opened them, which is already remarkably high. And about one in 1,000 became our customers. We can replicate this experiment for 100 million people during the next 12 months. And if we do that, we will get around about 100,000 paying customers, which will create a first year revenue run rate, an annualized run rate of $3.5 million, which by the way is about 10 times bigger in first year revenue run rate than any company I've ever created. And, I, and I've created some successful companies. What have we done so far? Well, we started with a team back in November 2013 and raised some money a few months later to build an iOS minimum viable product called Chat Center. We then built a web minimal viable product at chat.center. And more recently, we turned that website into a full SaaS solution, a cloud service that can support chat across multiple platforms. We added domain name support in May of this year and we just released an Android minimum viable product into the Google Play Store. So we're set up now to be able to be cross-platform, global, and grow. We want to raise $2 million, and we want to do it quickly so that we can take advantage of this opportunity. This is the current cap table. Uh, we were incubated at Archimedes Labs, who are one of our shareholders. The founders have roughly half the company. Uh, seed investors have about 20% and we have an option pool for future employees. For $2 million, you can be part of this cap table. And if you're interested, please contact me, chat.center slash Keith for real-time chat or keith at tira.com if you want to email me. Thank you. That is our pitch. So what we've done today then is we've talked about how startup funding has changed, what investors are looking for, how to think about your startup ideas, and once you've thought about them, how to tell the story so that an investor can get excited about them. And lastly, we showed you an example of how to do that. Thanks for your time, and uh, we can now move to questions.